two sets of introductions to follow, and I thank my uh, kind friends, Professor Carmody and Dr. Weiler, for uh, for that uh, very generous. And uh, thank you to uh, Western uh, Law for inviting me. Um, it's it's certainly uh, a bit of a homecoming for me. Uh, Todd likes to talk a bit about my background. Part of my background is the fact that uh, I, my family has a real connection with Western. My three of my grandparents were graduates of Western. Both my parents were graduates of Western. Uh, in fact, my father was uh, an LLB from 1966. So there's a real connection there. And in fact, during that period, I was born here. So London, Ontario is very close to me. Western is very close to me as well. Um, Todd has introduced me as someone uh, who's had an experience in the area of industrial state arbitration. And the basic <coughs> acronym we're using today, and, and you're going to hear it thrown around a lot, is ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement. And this term relates to um, the provision of the TPP, which deals with international dispute settlement. It's based on an arbitration model. You heard the doc, uh, Professor Carmody talk about that as an important part of Chapter 9 of TPP. And that, that'll be the focus uh, of my discussion. Um, the TPP, as we as we learned, as 6,000 pages is certainly outside my remit today to discuss. Um, but we have, we have a very interesting topic today. And um, actually, I had a bit of a different topic, but I think uh, Kai wanted to put something more provocative in. So it's promise or Trans-Pacific Partnership Promise or Peril for Canada. And I think, you know, if you can read that 6,000 pages, you'll probably find a bit of both. But with respect to the ISDS chapter, um, I think what we've seen here in the TPP is something that is very much following along the lines you've seen in many other uh, bilateral investment treaties. The, the acronym is BITS, or in Canada we call them Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Agreements, or FIPAs. What you've seen in, in the TPP is very much following a model that we've seen over the last uh, basically 20 years. It's, it's, a, it's a model not unfamiliar to those of you who've seen and read Chapter 11 in the NAFTA. That being said, there's been a great deal of developments and a great deal of evolution since the time that the NAFTA was drafted in the early 1990s. If you go back even further, you'll see that when BITS or FIPAs were drafted, they were usually short documents, six, 10 pages. Then the NAFTA was about 25 or 30 pages. And then with the TPP, we now have Chapter 9, which is about, I think, 52 pages. So it's, it's been an evolution of a, of a growing and more in-depth and more detailed treatment of this subject from a substantive point of view. And, and we saw the substantive standards were set up uh, on the screen by Professor Carmody. Um, this, there's there's a, bit, a variety of standards dealing with arbitrariness, discrimination, expropriation, performance requirements and expropriation are the main standards. I'm not going to focus on that today because I think that's a topic which deserves a much longer lecture, in fact. But I wanted to focus on something that was uh, kind of timely, kind of new. Um, not that all of this isn't new and that we're going to have the next two years to discuss TPP and Chapter 9 in a lot of detail. But what was, when I was coming today, I was thinking, what, what is kind of really kind of on the top uh, of the news for ISDS? And part of that is there is another treaty being negotiated, which involves another 27%, roughly, percent of the world GDP. And that's the treaty with the European Union. And another acronym, TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So we have TTIP being negotiated as well. And that's, that's another huge agreement. And it also has within it uh, a chapter on investment and a chapter on ISDS. And so we had some really interesting developments on the European front over the last year. The Europeans had a massive consultation. 150,000 submissions were made through an internet portal. The European uh, Union did a big report last May. And in that report, they came out with a challenge to themselves, which was, we need to change the model for ISDS. Our, the arbitration model, the international arbitration model that has been followed in, in BITS and, and FIPAs and free trade agreements like the NAFTA uh, for the past 20 years, that model 
is illegitimate. The word legitimacy comes up repeatedly. And there have been a lot of critiques of the legitimacy of ISDS. And in fact, we've seen uh, critiques uh, like the ones we saw earlier from, uh, from, Dr. Uh, from Professor Carmody. Um, there is a lack of support at various levels. Uh, we've seen some very specific criticisms. Uh, for instance, um, Senator Elizabeth Warren has referred to ISDS as, um, what was her exact phrase, uh, pseudo, oh, rigged pseudo courts was her exact uh, quote about what ISDS was. And President Obama himself has responded on this point and, and responded in res to her and her arguments. And he, quote, said, those arguments are just made up, unquote. So that's kind of where the debate is, you know, really detailed, right to the issues, very technical, you know, as he said, she said. Actually, the best part of the recent debate um, was a show actually done by John Oliver, the comedian. Um, he did a really interesting item on uh, Philip Morris's uh, suit against Australia under another bilateral investment treaty. And after going through the whole process of the idea that an international corporation could sue a government over something as uh, you know, sensitive, uh, a policy area as health and the regulation of, of cigarettes and so forth, he basically said, and I, I, this is a PG uh, setting, but he said, what the is this all about? And it really came to the idea, fundamentally, about how uh, an international company or an international claimant can actually sue a government uh, for, for something as fundamental as health um, or other issues, financial regulation or the environment. And those are all areas, policy areas, that have been the subject of numerous arbitrations over the last 15, 20 years. So when we get talk about the legitimacy debate, um, you look at the word legitimate, let's just sort of start at basis. Legitimate, at, at its most fundamental, it is a synonym for lawful. But when we look at that word in the political context, we see it as, as a much broader term, referring to kind of a, a general acceptance, a general knowledge of something, to the point that there's kind of a consensus that this is something that uh, you know, we accept as a community, as a legal community, as a broader community. And ISDS has kind of expanded itself from the legal technical world of trade law uh, to a much broader community, and, and John Oliver has uh, provided some of that uh, enlargement, as has Elizabeth Warren, as has uh, President Obama. Um, so where does this perception go? Where does this legitimacy argument uh, come from? Now, there's been a bit of an odyssey, as I said, that there's been a development, there's been an evolution through the treaties before the NAFTA, through the NAFTA, to the current treaties. Um, if we look back at some of the criticisms we saw when NAFTA was in its early stages, when Todd, Todd and I were working on some of the earlier NAFTA cases, you saw a number of interesting, what I'll call vignettes, uh, little moments in time, which, which, which kind of fueled this idea that there was a lack of legitimacy. And one of them, and, and it's still on the internet, and you can see it on YouTube, one of them was an interesting PBS show by Bill Moyers, and the title of the show was Trading Democracy, and it was all focused on NAFTA Chapter 11, and this was 2002, so over 13 years ago. And in that show, um, there was a discussion of a number of cases which were very current at the time, um, including two uh, very prominent ones, one called Methanex versus the United States, which was about uh, fuel additives in California <coughs> getting into the water. And another case was called Lowen versus the United States, which was about uh, a Mississippi court decision concerning a Canadian, Mr. Lowen. Um, uh, and the case was about uh, issues related to uh, a, a contract dispute, a $3 million contract dispute, which turned into a $700 million decision against Mr. Lowen in the courts of Mississippi. So, but these, during the time when, uh, when Bill Moyer was doing his PBS item, these were kind of in the air. And, it really seemed quite, um, I mean, it, it was really quite a, 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 a big issue at the time in the sense that you had these uh, unknown international tribunals. At the time, they were quite secret in the sense that there was 
very little transparency about the awards or the actual going wrong or the submissions. They weren't like courts in that sense. They followed what is a model in international arbitration, which is one of more privacy and confidentiality. So there was a big allegation of you know, secret courts. Um, and as, as well, um, there was an attack on this idea, or there was a, a criticism of this idea that public laws like health in the Methanex case or the American judicial system could be questioned uh, before an international tribunal. This was very novel. This was something that certainly um, everyone who was interviewed in the Bill Moyers item was kind of very surprised about. And I think that reflected a general surprise in the community that if you ask the average person if an international tribunal, you know, around 2002 could sue the United States for or a failed uh, court process, um, you probably wouldn't get too many people saying, oh yeah, NAFTA chapter 11. Because it just simply there wasn't that kind of awareness at the time. So we, we look at the Lowen case in particular, and that's another kind of vignette, another little moment in time in the early NAFTA um, days. And this was a case about denial of justice. And for those law students here who study public international law, you'll know that, that, that the principle of denial of justice is one that's in customary international law. It's the idea that if courts uh, violate these very fundamental procedure, uh, fundamental principles of, uh, of procedure, that there is a potential that they can be held liable uh, under that standard. Um, and interestingly, in the uh, Lowen case, and there's certainly lots to talk about in the Lowen case, um, there was. Um, a judge in that case who was appointed as one of the arbitrators, Judge Abner Mikva, um, who actually was very candid after that case was finished in 2004 to, to put on the record, and I think it's also available online, um, a, a speech he gave in a very much similar set setting as this at the Pace Law School uh, in a conference to talk about his experience with law. And, and it's actually very Interesting, you usually don't hear what the arbitrators have to say and you know, kind of their insights. And Judge Mikva was particularly interesting because he was a former congressman. He was a former uh, counsel uh, to Clinton in the White House. Uh, he was a former judge in the DC uh, District Court and a former chief judge. So someone with great political experience, uh, and great background in, in, in court procedures, Someone you'd think would, would know, you know, know his stuff. Especially being a congressman, he was very familiar with trade agreements. But when, when you look at, uh, and you listen carefully to his presentation at uh, the PACE conference, you'll see that he basically admitted very openly that he knew nothing about international arbitration, knew nothing about international law when he was appointed as the arbitrator, and that he was, frankly, very surprised that a U.S. court could be subject to any kind of international uh, measures, any kind of international remedy. And this is despite the fact that, um, in his own words, he said that the Mississippi courts were tort heaven, quote, and judges and juries are conditioned to give very, very large judgments, unquote. And then he went on to say, and this was his view of the facts of that, of that, uh, of that situation, he went on to say that the conduct against Lowen by the Mississippi courts was, quote, the most god-awful trial I have ever read about. It was incredible, unquote. So this is pretty, pretty um, tough stuff coming from an American judge talking about American courts. And many in the community out there who have studied the Lowen decision would say that this pretty much meets the definition of a denial of justice. But the fact is, and Judge McFoot is quite open about this as well, he takes credit for making sure that the decision did not go against the United States. He takes credit for, quote, saving American citizens several hundred million dollars, unquote, and worked with the other arbitrators to dismiss the case on a, a, what is also a very controversial jurisdictional ground. But I think what's really interesting about uh, Judge Mikva is that he, he really kind of embodied, I think, uh, just like the, the Bill Moyers report, he embodied kind of a the zeitgeist of what the heck is this mentality about ISDS. It just seemed to rub against this uh, idea, and particularly maybe this is a, a more American thing, uh, 
Uh, we're here in Canada, you know, Canadians are much more accepting, of course, but I, I think this applies probably more broadly. But um, this idea that our, our courts are kind of the last word. Um, and I, I think, you know, as law students here, we're, you know, we're students of the common law, as common law lawyers, you know, our familiarity is with the court system. You know, it's spent 2,000 years of development. It, this is a, an evolution to a process which is very familiar, very attractive, has lots of procedural safeguards, and our international arbitration is just something that's, that's new, it's something different. And you can see this reflected in, in the Bill Moyers report and by Judge Mikva. Uh, another other small anecdote, um, at the time of the Lowen case, um, there was a lot of discussion going on in the U.S. government. Um, until very recently, it was, it, it was very hard to know what was going on behind the scenes. But thanks to uh, presidential libraries and expirations of, of uh, confidential documents, we've seen in the Clinton presidential library a release of a number of quite interesting documents uh, and memos from this period of the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s by, uh, in particular, the White House discussing what to do about Loma. Because they were equally shocked much like Judge Mikva, much like Bill Moyers and the people he was interviewing them. And in fact, there was a memo in, in what was this, around 2000, and it was addressed to White House Chief of Staff Judge John Podesta, titled, Urgent Need for Policy Guidance to Resolve Interagency Litigation Strategy Dispute in Low and NAFTA Arbitration, unquote. Nice long subject line. Wouldn't work on Twitter, would it? Um, and basically, what was being muted there, or, or, sorry, mooted there, was this idea of whether, in fact, a court in the United States could be the subject of an international um, claim like this. And uh, some of the officials were saying, no, this, we've got to argue this. This is a point which we have to sort of put our, you know, put our uh, line, line in the sand, or, and we have to, to object to this, because American courts just cannot be the subject of an international claim. And others in the administration said, no, there's this denial of justice thing. And, and, and in addition, the rules of state responsibility and attribution say that courts are absolutely parts of the government, uh, part of the government. So to make these kind of arguments on a jurisdictional basis won't, won't fly. And I think as a result, um, those who were on that side, the, the side saying that we should go forward, that this is not the basis for a jurisdictional um, a jurisdictional objection uh, won out, but it was a real debate. So we have these various kind of points of, of, of reflection back to the early NAFTA days. So we forward now to 2015. We have TPP, we have TTIP, we have the debate ongoing. Still, I think, a lot of surprise about the idea about uh, investor state dispute settlement. What we have uh, in, in the NAFTA cases, we have about 20 cases uh, that the U.S. has had uh, again, uh, launched against it. The U.S. has uh, never lost a NAFTA case. Uh, unlike the U.S., Canada has had about uh, 35 cases and lost uh, six cases. Um, but when we look back to Bill Moyers and we look back to the early NAFTA days 15 years ago, we have to ask the question, has there been a fundamental weakening of de democratic values like was predicted by Bill and Moyers? And I think you can look at this in two ways. One is the substantive uh, way. You look to the substantive standards and say, you know, you apply these to the cases that have occurred and, and, and you look at them in a specific context and say, have, have these standards kind of overshot? And that's certainly something, you know, we can discuss. And I know Todd and Kai would uh, love to get into that. Um, I think just from a broad point of view, I think you can say that the standards have been pretty strict and applied pretty strictly, but at the very least when you look at the new TPP version, the new, the new revisions from the NAFTA model, uh, you, you can see that there's been a lot of uh, additional tinkering and, and, and detail work by the negotiators to, to get a real handle on what those provisions uh, mean. So I think that's uh, pretty well taken care of. The other side in which, and as I said, the TTIP has provided some interesting uh, fodder for discussion. The other side of uh, the discussion is the procedural one. 
And this goes to the idea of, is the arbitral model that we've seen in NAFTA, and that is in TPP, is that acceptable uh, when we look at TTIP and we look at the European Union, which has just recently provided us a, its proposal to the United States for uh, what could be a very different model for dispute resolution. And that's following, in their own words, they call it an investment court. And they want to follow, ostensibly, a court model for dispute resolution. And rather than referring to the tribunal members as arbitrators, they call them judges. So there's a fair bit of marketing and branding going on here to kind of change the perception of the dispute resolution under TTIP to, in their view, to something that is perhaps more legitimate. The idea of branding it as a court brings it kind of the, the, the aura of, of being more legitimate. So really that's kind of the test, I guess, at least from TTIP's point of view, is, is this something that uh, is actually more legitimate? And we can look at a few uh, of the elements of the new TTIP model, and, and perhaps this will be instructive for the TPP negotiations or for the process uh, negotiations are over, but for the process over the next year or two, when we're looking at TPP to, to kind of look at TTIP to, to kind of hold up a, a mirror of two, you know, very big treaties and whether one model is perhaps better than the other or, and I think that's a reasonable position to come out to, is that perhaps the TTIP model isn't that much different than what we were seeing in the traditional model uh, found in TPP. So, just to give you a little bit of background on the TTIP model, the European model that's been uh, put out only a few weeks ago, their idea is to actually have um, uh, two levels of tribunals. So there will be a first level of tribunal, uh, sort of a court of first instance, which, which hears, hears the cases, and they're actually set on very strict timelines of getting their cases done in, in a year and a half to two years, and then there's an opportunity for an appeal. So there's an appellate court, and then that process is supposed to take nine months to a year. Um, so what, what, what we've seen is the inclusion, and this is very important from the Europeans' point of view, is, is this appellate body, which in their words has the objective of assuring consistency in, in the jurisprudence. So consistency. And, and when you think about that, yeah, that's, that makes sense. We're common law lawyers, we like courts, we agree. Appellate courts are good. They, they keep, if you're going to make law, you want to make sure you make it right, and you want to make sure that somebody's looking over your shoulder to make sure you did the right thing. Um, so that makes sense. But the question then is, and part of, this is part of one of the big questions about TTIP, um, is that value of consistency? Is that something that we need in ISDS? And this has been a big debate in terms of the debate between arbitration and a court model. Because in arbitration, for some of you who have taken uh, international commercial arbitration or any type of arbitration, you know that the value, one of the important values of arbitration is finality. It's the idea of an efficient process. Whether it's actually efficient or not is, is debatable. But the, the value is that arbitration should be more efficient, that you should be able to do it more quickly, and that the awards are fine. So consistency is, in fact, not a big value. Because each arbitration is supposed to be a standalone uh, uh, exercise between the parties themselves. Law is not being created in any sense. There is no binding nature of one arbitration to another. To, to, it's really just a decision that's supposed to be between the two parties. Whereas when we see in this court model, the TTIP model, it really does beg the question about whether um, when you have an appellate body looking for consistency, whether that appellate body, in fact, itself will be making law to some extent. I mean, why else do you want consistency? Why do you want to make law? Um, in, in, in the context of uh, international investment, ISDS, the critiques, many of the critiques have been about the fact that some of these arbitration tribunals had too much influence and that a bad decision would have um, some sort of precedential value. And I, I, frankly, I think from the negotiator's point of view, the idea that uh, an, invest, an, an, an ISDS arbitral award has no precedential value is, is actually probably a good thing. Whereas under the TTIP model, we, we are actually setting up 
international jurisprudence. And this is very different from what you see even um, in the ICJ context or even in most international tribunals. The, the idea is that they're not creating law, they're not creating precedent. And this is really, I think, probably the biggest um, change with what will happen under a TTIP, uh, TTIP type model. So when you're also looking at the new TTIP rules, they, they have some other interesting elements, which um, begs the question about whether we should be seeing more of these in TPP as well. One is a more fulsome set of arbitrator ethical rules. And I think we can agree that that's uh, always a good thing. Um, international arbitration does not have a ruling bar association giving ethical guidelines and, uh, and regulations. So the idea that, that a, a more rigid, uh, understandable ethical structure is set up for arbitrators, I think, is, is very acceptable. Or sorry, for, for judges in the TTIP context. Um, could that be applied in the TPP context? Absolutely. And that's certainly something to be looked at. Looked at. The, one of the other innovations in TTIP is this idea of having um, judges, the judges, only appointed um, for, uh, in this case, six-year periods um, by the government. And this is quite different from what we see, uh, sorry, by the parties, by the TTIP parties. And th this is quite a different model uh, of choosing uh, arbitrators or judges because under the arbitration model, and this is, this is one of the things that uh, really sets arbitration aside from the court model, is that the parties actually both get to choose one arbitrator, and depending on the legal process, they either have some say in choosing the president, president or the president will be chosen by uh, the institution governing the arbitration. So when, when they've, actually there's been a recent survey by Queen Mary uh, Law School in, in London, and in that survey, they showed that inter for international arbitration, the idea of the parties actually both being able to pick one of their arbitrators is, is one of the real attractions uh, of international arbitration. But we see in the TTIP model, um, again, very much following more of a court-like uh, type uh, procedure where the, the parties will pick panels. In this case, uh, for the lower panel, there would be three chosen by the United States, three chosen by the e EU, and then another three chosen from uh, third countries. Uh, and the idea is they would be randomly make up these tribunals. Um, the, the question from, uh, and this goes to the kind of general legitimacy point in, in arbitration, the question goes then in the TTIP model whether uh, having only one party pick all the arbitrators, whether that really gets around the critiques uh, about potential bias of having party appointed arbitrators. Because that, that's one of, one of the, the, the real criticisms by uh, those who um, are, are critical of ISDS, is that this idea that the parties have any choice of the arbitrators somehow will lead to uh, a lack of independence or bias um, by the arbitrators. And uh, really, you have to ask the question about whether having the government's parties, who are always the respondents in these cases, choosing all the arbitrators, whether that actually creates uh, less of a perception uh, of bias. Um, another innovation, and this is an implied uh, criticism of the arbitration model, is that the, I, uh, the TTIP model from the EU emphasizes uh, only appointing judges with what they call high qualifications. Uh, individuals uh, would have qualification, qualifications of a judge or Supreme Court judge or you know some very senior individual. But they also uh, emphasize that these individuals must be very experienced uh, in international law and in arbitration. And part of the reason for this element of the TTIP model is basically one of the critiques of the arbitration model, which is that in arbitration there's a relatively small group of international arbitrators. They tend to be very experienced, very senior individuals. Um, uh, they're a mix generally of academics and uh, former judges and practitioners. And one of the, one of the big critiques of arbitration is that um, for, that, that group is um, you know, too connected. 
that uh, they're too, too much part of uh, a specific arbitration community. So uh, what was sometimes be called the club, the arbitration club. Um, and part of the uh, EU's way of dealing with this is to um, try to get a very specific quality, uh, I think, of individual. But when you're looking at these, um, the way that these uh, tribunals are appointed for a six-year term, there is also a condition that they can't practice uh, as counsel in any other cases. Um, I think there's also a likelihood that we're going to have a very small, again, a very small group of judges uh, who will be part of these tribunals, which also uh, leads to a similar criticism of arbitration of that there will be a limited group. But this will be, um, again, not, not a widely represented group uh, of arbitrators. So it, it, it kind of begs the question about whether it's really uh, an issue of, of kind of creating this judge-like group, or whether it's perhaps uh, putting in a better appointment system, which can then balance out uh, the interests uh, of the parties. Um, so just finishing off then on the uh, TTIP model, um, I think the real focus uh, of the TTIP is this uh, idea um, of the appellate uh, model. Um, and, and I want to focus on, on, on one last point. And I, I mentioned this earlier. It, it's the idea about what, what these tribunals should be doing. Um, in the arbitration model, the, the focus is, is certainly on, what, on, uh, on the dispute between the parties. When you have a court uh, and, and this value of consistency, the idea is that, um, that this is somehow perhaps jurisprudential, that somehow that there will be um, a precedent set and that you need to get it right. And, and I'm not so sure, and, and I raise that question about whether that is in fact the model that should be used going forward. I, I think it's very um, comforting to know that we have uh, the second look, but it really goes to the question of whether the tribunals themselves, the, the experience we've seen in the last 15 years, has uh, demanded that dramatic uh, a change. So let me, I think uh, <laughs> my time is probably uh, coming to an end, but let me um, ask a few sort of questions and maybe we could have a, you know, some questions and have a discussion here because I think some of you have been examining this and looking at this. Um, for the arbitration model advocates, there really has been um, a critique uh, uh, of having a more court-like model uh, because they say that we're more efficient. We have this idea of finality, this is something that should be valued. But it, it, you really must ask the question, is arbitration itself more efficient? Is there not something we can do to make the ISD, pro, ISDS process more efficient? And I think the t model actually has some time limits in place, has some new procedural mechanisms in place that look like um, they're trying to address some of those issues. Um, to those who are more a court model advocate, and I think many of us find it very attractive, um, I raise the question again, is consistency and predictability uh, really what we should be looking for? Is that, is that really the most important model uh, in, in an international dispute uh, process? So a final question, um, and, and I raised this at the beginning. If you, if you look at the, the two models, the arbitration model and the new model, that uh, the arbitration model under TPP and the new model we see under uh, TTIP, um, really, are they that much different? Um, I think in many ways they're not. Um, I think in some ways just by calling something a court and having judges and having uh, appointments and, and having an appeal mechanism is very attractive. But I think if we look at it in, in some amount of detail, we might see that uh, in fact uh, the model under TPP and the model that we've had um, is not that greatly different. So. I hope I've raised a number of questions and I hope uh, we can uh, have a bit of a discussion.
Um, certainly happy to talk more widely about the Chapter 9 and uh, both uh, of the, of the uh, investment chapters in TTIP and TPP. So thank you very much.